Hello and welcome everyone to another episode of the None of Our Businesses YouTube show and podcast. I'm coming to you today from my uh, new office under construction. And then uh, we have with us as always to discuss uh, the weekly news from accountant's perspective. We have Charlie Zygmunt. Hi everybody. And AJ Wheeler. How's it going? And of course myself, Ty Carr. And this is our show, None of Our Businesses, where we're gonna talk about everyone else's business. So let's get into it, guys. Right on. All right. Our first article this week, uh, this is from Small Business Trends, but um, I saw this going around a bit. So the Labor Department has proposed clarifications to the independent contractor rule. And what this stems from is uh, U.S. Department of Labor is proposing to clarify the so-called independent contractor rule. And what this rule does is it basically defines whether a worker is an employee or an independent contractor. So uh, in the proposal, uh, according to the Secretary of Labor, aims to bring clarity and consistency to the determination of who's an independent contractor under the Fair Labor Standards Act. So what this new rule would adopt is basically uh, you would look at two core factors first, the nature and degree of the worker's control over the work and the worker's opportunity for profit or loss based on initiative and or investment. And then kind of if that water is murky, then you can kind of go into three other factors to be considered addition, called additional guideposts is what they're calling. So those three additional guideposts is the amount of skill required for the work, the degree of permanence of the working relationship between the worker and the potential employer, and whether the work is part of an integrated unit of production. So this is basically a very kind of business friendly definition. If you look at those kind of factors and deciding kind of bullet points, it's essentially kind of I guess, airing more towards, if you think about like Uber or something, to me, it feels like they're kind of more leaning towards everybody's an independent contractor in that sense. And uh, the late, so I guess they're still, they're still, uh, you know, getting public comment on this. So it's not finalized, but it, the DOL does state that they believe the revised test will redu reduce worker misclassification, reduce litigation, increase efficiency, and increase job satisfaction and flexibility. I don't know how it does that, but uh, that's essentially what they're talking about. But I'd like to get your guys' take. Do you think the independent contractor rule is broken? I know we've talked about certain individual cases regarding like Uber or Lyft or those kind of things where in California they want to be classified as uh, you know, employees and that there should be some worker protections rolled into that versus, you know, I'm sure Uber itself wants to continue to consider these people independent contractors and 1099 in them. So I'd like to get your guys' kind of take on whether or not you think the new rule helps, you know, or, or who it helps and it, it, or if you even think it's necessary to kind of better define this. Yeah, I don't know if I'd go as far as to say that it's broken, but I do think it could definitely be improved. And I do think it's one of those things that people don't always understand and they get themselves into situations where they think they know how the tax is going to work out and they get surprised at the end of the year with a tax bill that they maybe weren't expecting. And so I think anything that adds clarity to that is, is a good idea. Um, and I do think that some of the rules before have been kind of vague because it's not always clear exactly how you define who is a, a contractor and who isn't. Um, but yeah, I've definitely seen this be a point of contention. And um, a lot of times people think that if you agree to it, then that's what drives it. But in reality, it's more about what the, what the actual rules say. And so I think anything we do to clarify that is a good idea. What do you think, Ty? Yeah, I would agree. I think, um, I don't know if, if their proposal meets this objective, but if, if, there, if it actually does clarify the rules, I think the objective of clarifying who is an independent contractor versus who is an employee is always a good, would always be a good thing because this has been a longstanding uh, issue that has left open, uh, left open problems, uh, compliance problems for some businesses on, on one hand, and then on the other hand, uh, you, you've had people taking egregious advantage of it too. So, you know, I've seen both sides. I've seen businesses that, that try to do things the best they could the right way, but end up with compliance nightmares because the rules weren't clear. And then I see people who using, you try to use the fact that the rules aren't clear to, to drive a semi truck through the loopholes in the rules to, to classify people as contractors who really are uh, clearly employees. Um, I think, you know, 
I, we talked a little bit about this before when we when we did talk about independent contractors versus employees in the context of Uber and the California rules. And it's important to realize that you've got multiple different state and federal agencies weighing in on this topic. And when we talked about it previously, we were talking about the state, state weighing in on their, their, their Department of Labor, weighing in on their rules as to who was an independent contractor or not for the purpose of state uh, rules of fairness and equity with employees versus contractors. Um, in this case, we have the Federal Department of Labor. So this is still not the Treasury or tax rules per se that we're talking about. This is the Federal Department of Labor weighing in as it relates to defining who is an independent contractor versus who is a um, who is an employee uh, for the purpose of the Fair Labor Standards Act is what I see here in the in the article. What's interesting to me about that from a pragmatic standpoint is that when it comes to you know when it comes to the HR legal issues of uh, fair labor standards, um, I guess there's some federal rules and there's state rules, but you know, most often in practice, I see state rules that come into play more often than the federal rules on this anyway. Um, so I, the thing about the, the thing that this brings to mind are a couple of potential pitfalls. You know, can they do something here federally that then is not, uh, doesn't harmonize with state rules? Like, you know, when we were reviewing those California rules and their attempt to try to make the definition of an employee more expansive so that Uber drivers would have to be classified as employees, for example, would the state rule still stand if the federal rule about fair labor standards was different? And if those two definitions are different, that's not going to be super helpful. And then secondarily, you know, as Charlie was bringing up the tax issues, you know, will the, will the IRS and the Department of Treasury follow the standard that the Federal Department of Labor sets out here? That would be ideal, you know, if they would say, okay, hey, Federal Department of Labor has just clarified what they think an independent contractor is, so we'll just follow that for tax purposes. But, you know, unfortunately with this government, we don't know that that would happen. So that could be yet another uh, area of, of confusion is that somebody may be classified for fair labor standards one way and the IRS determines they should be classified differently uh, for tax purposes. And that would be a, a potential pitfall too. So, so yeah, I mean, it seems uh, like clarification is a good step in the right direction, but I don't, I guess I don't know how this harmonizes across the different jurisdictions and uh, authorities that get into this issue of, of independent contractor versus, versus employee. So th those are, those are all things that come to my mind. Like usual, I'm just poking holes in all the things that could go wrong. I don't have any real answers. Actually, you brought up a good point that I wasn't even thinking of where you could, you know, like this has the potential where you could be considered an employee by California per se, and then an independent contractor on a federal level. And then, then you're left with the conundrum of which one do you choose or how do you classify them? You know, which one trumps what? And so that's an interesting take I hadn't thought of. So here's, here's another thing I always think about when something like this comes up, you know, usually you always think about who's the one paying the tax and how does that end up becoming an issue if a person feels like they've been misclassified. But the other interesting thing is that a lot of states use whether or not you have employees in that state as a driver and determining whether or not you have nexus or presence in that state. And so while on the one hand, of course, it's a question of does the employee versus the employer pay the tax, but there are potentially even other unrelated taxes like sales taxes that could be on the line based on the outcome of how you define uh, whether a person is an employer or a contractor. Um, so yeah, I just think it's an interesting topic. Uh, I've got another article here we can talk about from ABC News called BMW Find $18 million for Inflating Monthly U.S. Sales Figures. And so what's happened is that BMW was attempting to secure an $18 billion corporate bond offering, uh, several corporate bond offerings. And as part of trying to share the information for that process, they inadvertently disclosed that through 2015 through 2019, that they had basically not reported sales in an earlier period, called that group of sales the bank. And then during later years, when they weren't meeting their monthly sales figures, they then said, okay, we're gonna take a little bit from the bank and we're gonna recognize these sales to meet our figures. And they went on and on for a couple of years until, uh, until this happened. And now they've, uh, you know, SEC is looking into it and there's been uh, all these fines levied. They have not admitted or denied the wrongdoings, but they are agreeing to pay the fines. And uh, this is not the only car company that's been accused of something like this. Fiat Chrysler had a similar thing a couple of years ago. 
Um, and so I guess I want to get your guys' take on whether or not automakers, I guess not automakers, but, you know, are these financials to be trusted when things like this happen that um, enable them to manipulate, uh, you know, the figures? Well, I mean, the, the scheme the scheme has the complexities to it, as you kind of got into. But, you know, in the first paragraph, when I was looking at the article, they talked about essentially what that scheme allowed them to do was maintain a reserve of earnings to then pull out when they wanted. Right. So this is kind of a classic. This is a classic um, reporting, what we'd say, reporting fraud or reporting scheme of earnings management that public companies in the U.S. have uh, engaged in or attempted to engage in a lot of different public companies over, over a long time. And it's like, you know, the goals of it are pretty nuanced in the first place, right? Because essentially what they're doing is in the long run, they're not, they're not actually reporting anything that isn't, that, that doesn't kind of work its way out of the system, so to speak in the long run. So it's all about kind of smoothing how things look over a period of time so that there aren't sudden, uh, uh, so that you have this nice, steady, slow growth curve, right? Because that's what investors like to see is this idea that, that the company is constantly uh, making more and making more year after year on a steady basis rather than making a whole lot and then dipping and then not making a lot for a while kind of thing. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that um, it's, yeah, I mean, it, it's a it, it's a classic problem. They get... I mean, it seems like the just getting a fine for it almost just seems like a slap. Eighteen million dollars for BMW sounds like you know barely a slap on the wrist. I mean, nobody, I don't know who is personally taking taking a hit for this. Um, and eighteen million dollars as a dollar amount just doesn't seem like a whole lot for BMW. Let's also remember that the whole process that brought this about was them trying to get $18 billion in bonds. And so if this kind of fraud helped them to secure that, then, of course, $18 million isn't going to mean anything. And so, What I found interesting in the article, and, and I was Googling it to see who their auditor was, was there was no mention of any kind of repercussions for the audit firm that performed the, the audits for the BMW company. So I'm wondering... And my thought is, is, you know, and we've seen it in the news, you know, audit firms behaving badly or whatever you want to call it with some high profile uh, snafus in the audit of public companies recently. And what I've, so I'm wondering if these weren't management reports that were doing this, the audits were clear and they were using managerial accounting, you know, man, management reports, but that's probably not the case seen as they're a large financial company i imagine the bank the issuing banks for those bonds would be it but i'm just really surprised not to see the auditor drug into this yeah as well, part of the problem to clarify that point they're fined by the sec so it would not you know the sec would not take interest in internal management reports sure uh, so yeah it's definitely it's definitely their their external sales that they were manipulating um uh what was the issue yeah, it is interesting that, you know, why, why wasn't the auditor uh, drug into this, drug into <clears> the <throat> question? And maybe when did this break? Maybe that's still to come. Um, this came out see. September 24th. So maybe, maybe there's more to come in terms of. Yeah. And I think I did a quick Google search. Um, PwC seems to be the one that's doing the audit, but they weren't mentioned in that article. I don't want to badmouth PwC if they weren't at fault here, but that's that's what Dr. Google told me, mm. you know. So I, I do think it's interesting, though, that they weren't brought up in the suit. If it, And especially if it's as far reaching back as six or seven years or whatever the article was stating, that it wouldn't the auditor wouldn't be called into question here. I'm just one more thing to add on. Uh, we were talking about how some of their stuff was just a timing issue because they're just moving sales into another period. The other thing they did that is maybe a little more egregious is that they paid dealers to call. Uh, they had cars that were on dealer lots had not been sold. And then they paid the dealers to say that they had been sold or that they were demonstration type vehicles so that they could recognize that revenue. And so it's a little more egregious because that car may have never been sold, you know, um, so not quite a timing issue on that part. All right, you got another article we can talk about, AJ? Yeah, absolutely. So my next article actually deals with 
Trump income taxes. So news broke this week. New York Times published uh, leaks, for lack of a better word, of uh, tax data. And so this is actually in an accounting perspective. This is from Accounting Today. And the title, I think, is a little more inflammatory than, than what the article is getting at. And I'll explain here in a second. So the, the title of the article is Trump paying $750 in income tax shows why he's a billionaire. So uh, essentially what the article tries to do um, is say, and, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, and I'll take a quote here from Thorne Perkin, the president at the asset, asset management group. So your tax return at the end of the day shows income and whatever deductions are claimed against that income. That's it. And essentially what they're talking about in this article is that the fact that he paid $750 uh, taking the political stance or, you know, like the inflammatory nature out of that is that he is adhering to a set of rules that are set out by the tax, the IRS and is preparing his tax return based on those rules. And at the end of that exercise, his uh, tax return is $750 owed. And the way this happened was, is that uh, he had essentially some operating losses, offset with operating gains, so couple that with some investment in real estate that was either at a loss or a gain, and all of that then netting out to a, a bill for $750. And I think the reason why this is, you know, like shocking or inflammatory to a lot of the American public probably is because they probably paid a lot more in taxes than Donald Trump did, and they have a lot less net worth or revenue. And so I think from my point of view, and I'd like to get your guys' take on this, um, and this is just my point of view is, I think, you know, say what you will about Trump and how you feel about him, but this is essentially just, you know, playing by the rules that are set out by the IRS. And I feel if anybody should be kind of finger shaken at, or if you feel like these are unjust rules or that's an unjust amount to pay in income taxes, then I think we should probably levy for different laws and not so much pin this on one person because the way the rules are written now, everybody has the ability to use these same deductions. Now, whether or not they apply to you because you don't own lots of real estate or have interest income or anything like that of a sizable amount or losses that you can put forth, um, the rules are there and they don't discriminate except maybe by how much money you have or how, my, how many assets and everything you have. Um, but I'd like to get your guys' take and whether or not maybe I'm just, you know, whimsical and thinking about it from an accounting perspective or if this is something that maybe I think maybe people get wrong in the general public sometimes. Um, well, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, I don't I, I think that the sentiment that this is not personally about Trump, like if you have a I, I think kind of what you're getting at, which I would agree with, is if you see this story and you think this guy clearly must have more cash flow than what he's paying tax on. Um, and that doesn't seem fair. The, the lack of fairness here isn't because he personally did something uh, that was unique to him. It is because of the way the tax law favors real estate investment. Uh, real, estate and, real estate business and real estate investment has had favored tax status in this country for a very long time. Business has favored tax status but not as much as real estate, you know, so business itself, being in business gives you some favorable options in terms of reducing your overall tax burdens, but being in the real estate business, it really does it. And yeah, that depreciation, as they talk about in the article, is one big piece of that, but but this is true for any real estate developer. So it's not, it's, it, it's nothing, it's not unique to Trump that his tax bill doesn't seem to match his cash flow. Um, it, it is the function. It is what is typical for people who are uh, heavily uh, in the real estate business. I mean, it, the, it's hard to be in. It, it's hard to be in the real estate business. And I'm not saying it's hard work like Trump works harder than other people, but it's that there are limitations to being to be able to be in it because you generally need capital, or you need, or you need uh, lenders who believe in you enough to give you the capital, which he's always managed to. Uh, somehow work his way into the graces of uh, banks and lenders who uh, bankroll uh, what he's doing, right? So, so yeah, I mean, the fact any particular number of ta uh, dollar amount that somebody pays in tax 
in any particular year is pretty meaningless to me because there's, you know, that your tax profile is built over long numbers of years. There's things that carry forward back and forth between years. You know, it's, it's hard to really put that number in context other than to say it's not super shocking given that he's in business and that he's a real estate developer, that he would have a relatively low tax bill compared to his cash flow if that's what people are complaining about. Yeah, and the other thing I thought was interesting is, I mean, the article isn't even finding outrage in comparing his cash flow to his tax burden. Let's be careful here. They're specifically comparing his net, wor- his net worth to his tax burden, and that's just not how tax works. Tax isn't taken on your net worth at the end of each year, and so kind of the whole point of outrage is just not well put together in the article, in my opinion, um, because, yeah, if we were looking at his cash flow, then at least we'd have you know, something more to be outraged about, but. Yeah, I mean, mean, that's an important distinction. We have income taxes, not wealth taxes for the most part. You know, there's a few different kinds of taxes that we have federally and and statewide that are somewhat kind of quasi wealth taxes, but generally we tax income. And, you know, what's interesting from a political standpoint is that seems to be a universally accepted methodology, both by Republicans and Democrats, right? You don't have Joe Biden out there saying, hey, we should quit taxing income and start taxing wealth so that we get money from these really these billionaires. Um, You know, so I think that that's uh, I think that's an important distinction that you just made, Charlie. It's something people have to understand is we tax income. We don't tax wealth in this country. And those aren't the same thing. You know, you can I always say that between rich and wealth is like, uh, I don't think I'll be wealthy in my lifetime. (laughs) Uh, because wealth means you have you have a high net worth. You have a lot of you have a lot of assets. You have a lot uh, a lot uh, under your name already. You're you, you've got it. Um, I aspire to be rich, which means that I think if I work hard, I'll probably have a high income. Um, but but that's you know that's not the same as being wealthy. If I become rich at some point, be, that won't be the same as being wealthy. That'll just mean that I have a high income for for doing uh, a lot of work and. And that's the thing is that we go after income and we go after the rich when um, some people confuse that with going after wealth and the wealthy. They're not the same thing. I also might mention, I think, you know, I think the way that norm I, we talked about real estate kind of having a preferential tra- tax treatment, and that's true for every taxpayer, you know, your, your home interest and ta- taxes paid on your home residence are, are the reason why probably 99% of people itemize their tax, personal tax return. And so the same beneficial treatment that you would get out of real estate as an investor, you can reap as a soul, as a homeowner or, or even a small time investment or real estate investor having small rental properties. And also I might say that I feel wealthy with a great host and co-host here at the uh, podcast. Without you guys, I would feel poor. So I feel wealthy already. I'm glad you said it because I was feeling that same way. (laughs) Very helpful. All right. uh, You got another one for us, Charlie? Yeah, I've got another one we can talk about. All right. So I've got an article from Mercury News called uh, Lower Pay, Higher Risk. Coronavirus layoffs send middle class workers down the economic ladder. And so what it's looking at is that in California, more, uh, a record number of Californians are filing for unemployment, and many of them are highly educated, having like doctor, doctorate degrees and master's degrees. And because there are so many people in so few jobs, what they're finding is that people are willing to uh, kind of step down their standards quite a bit and take jobs that they otherwise wouldn't take for fear of their job not coming back. Um, And so basically the article focuses in on a Safeway hiring director who has been um, having this deluge of highly trained people. And so I guess I want to talk to you guys about whether or not you think that one of the side effects of this whole like coronavirus pandemic is going to be a, um, a sort of devaluing of education that happens when you have so many skilled people to where everybody's just trying to fill jobs and now having this doctorate degree that used to really set you apart isn't as amazing as it maybe used to be. And so I want to get you guys' take on that. I might add, like when when I was reading this article, it made me think of, so back in the 90s, I worked at a call center and we did roadside assistance, like 
kind of like AAA, but we weren't AAA. So if you broke down and you had whatever insurance, you called a number and you got me and I worked for like 20 different companies or whatever. I wasn't the best employee, but uh, there was always stories about call centers in India that uh, where, you know, like in America, you had to have a high school diploma, for instance, to work at this call center. That was one of the requirements and you had to be able to type and whatever. But in India where call centers were exploding at the time, this is in the late nineties, uh, they would have applicants around the corner that had doctorates or master's degrees applying for these jobs in a call center. And so realistically what I see here is what the market is demanding or what, what's available in the market. And then people with college degrees or what we call overqualified people not finding a job in the market and then applying for something that's quote unquote below their education level or are overqualified for. And I think this is, I think we're going to see more of this with the, with the explosion of the internet, you, you know, like in looking at our accounting profession, I've met many a non degreed accountants that could probably run circles around some accountants that I know um, and vice versa. You know, you find somebody that claim, you know, that has a four year degree or even a five or six year degree in accounting and they can run circles around, you know, somebody that's been in the industry for 20, 30 years, you know? So I think we're seeing more a results and a kind of market driven economy probably. And we're moving more towards that as to what you can bring and what the market will bear as opposed to, you know, the way that like our parents' generation saw a college degree. If you had a college degree, you were set, you know, kind of thing. And you demanded a higher salary. I think nowadays, like, let's, let's face it, YouTube, you know, if you, you know, you're not going to school to be a video editor for somebody, some big YouTuber, you're showing your portfolio of work and being able to provide that to somebody as, as like a thing. There's no, you know, video, video editing. I'm sure there is, but you know, nobody that's in the industry that's working, your portfolio speaks for you. And so I guess my, my kind of statement to anybody out there is provide yourself with your own portfolio of work, you know, go through your job, whatever that is, but specifically to your accounting, to the accounting people out there is go through your job and learn as much as you can. Even if you're a staff accountant somewhere, take the initiative to find what happens, you know, farther up in the food chain, for instance, for lack of a better word, find out what happens to your, to your job once you hit that next rung or that next ladder and understand the business better from a holistic accounting approach. And it'll serve you better going down the line, whether it's in the same company you have, but what you're doing is you're expanding your own portfolio of work and you're being, and you're, you have more things to offer in the market. And the market, I think, is going to dictate more of salaries and more of hiring than it does has in the past, I think, is where we're headed. Because knowledge is, is available for everybody out there right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have much to add to most of that. I mean, I think, I think if you, to, to summarize it, in a, um, is that, yeah, anytime, anytime that, you have more people looking for jobs than there are jobs in total, you're going to see uh, this, you're going to see this exact thing where you've got over people who are quote unquote overqualified or have uh, levels of training or education that aren't necessary for certain jobs applying for those jobs. Right. Um, I think the idea of, you know, I think when we, I think sometimes we're a little cavalier or, I, I don't know. I have this weird feeling in my gut when we say that somebody's over, or people are overqualified for certain jobs because they have certain education. They're they're different qualified. <laughs> they're, they have education that is not necessarily helpful for that job. But you know, somebody who has a PhD doesn't isn't necessarily overqualified for uh, for grocery store operations um, if they've never worked in that kind of setting before ever. Um, you know, depending on what their PhD is in and versus somebody who has had a lot of experience working and managing a crew in a grocery store. So, so yeah, that, that's a, that's a tangent, I guess, for me to rail against the term overqualified in that way. But, but I think what's interesting about, I mean, when you set that premise up and you say, okay, you've got all these people, lots of people with education, lots of people with kinds of training, lots of people with degrees and certification and not enough jobs. So now you may end up with this scenario that you've got people who are uh, lots of people applying for jobs that there seems to be a mismatch, right? 
What's interesting about that dynamic saying that we're that that this article saying that that is being seen or some people are doing that is that the unemployment rate across the board is not particularly high. Um, and and then uh, and, and so I think another another kind of aspect to this right now in the situation that we're in is that it's not evenly dispersed. It's not distributed across all the jobs and all the all the roles out there in our economy and our society. Right. So I, I think when it comes to like uh, information workers, as they call it, and, and tech jobs, even for accounting, I don't think we necessarily see that there is a dearth of qualified people and not enough jobs in those areas, because those are jobs, those are roles that can can be done uh, from home or remotely um, or office settings that are not frontline type of work and. Uh, and the need for those jobs hasn't immediately caved in, right? So the supermarket scenario sounds right to me in the sense that, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think there are a lot of roles and jobs for people who uh, were doing a lot of stuff, particularly in the service industry um, or in industries that had high contact where a lot of those jobs have collapsed, where during this pandemic, we're either just not doing those things as a, as a society or an economy, or we found other ways to do them that don't require, like we do more grocery delivery. So we don't have as many, uh, we don't have as much need for uh, open grocery stores for people to browse all the time. Right. Um, we do more food delivery. So there's not as many people dining in at restaurants, obviously right now, um, all of that creates a difference in demand, but in a very particular sector. Right. So I don't know what I don't I don't know what to make of that. And yeah, the example that you guys cited in this article of the grocery store kind of supervisor uh, saying, well, they're receiving lots and lots of qualified applicants. I, I don't know what that means. Does that mean other people who would be working in those areas that that wouldn't necessarily surprise me if a lot of service workers were looking for jobs and, and a service uh, kind of uh, hands-on type of job, like working in a grocery store is getting a flood of applicants because the people, because the number of jobs in that sector has diminished and the number of people seeking jobs in that sector is greater. Um, but that could happen while it doesn't necessarily affect the rest of the economy is kind of the, I think the problem we're facing right now is that everything is, is very segregated into the various sectors of the economy. Well, and I might probably mention, I can tell you who those overqualified candidates aren't. They're not people with accounting degrees looking for, you know, like, I think if you have the right kind of degree, you can find a job either, you know, in your field or field adjacent, at least, you know, and, and it may not be your dream job, but you have a skill set and you stuck out like uh, a higher educational requirement or, or like a higher skilled job than say if you took an easier major in college for instance yeah. you know oh, i agree with that a hundred percent because yeah i've met so many people who have higher level degrees but in a topic that just is not as practical and so i think like you know accounting is in a lot of ways feels like the boring choice but it is like the safe choice in terms of job security and in terms of just like making sure that you have a practical skill um, I think the other thing you said that I really that really hits home is the idea of uh, b beefing up your portfolio as opposed to the education because I think nowadays a lot of hiring decisions are made on like what what can be shown what is actually there because a lot if everyone has a degree then okay you're on the same field as all those people but what you can show that you've done either through a business portfolio or whatever your skill set is I think can really help set you apart and be a good substitute for um, for a more traditional degree. Yeah, I think uh, along those lines, what we see in accounting, which I suspect is true across a lot of industries, is that there there seems to continue to always be this need for people who truly have experience in the profession and in the industry, right? Um, there's lots of people who uh, theoretically could do the job or think they could do the job or whatever, but the actual, the actual number of people that uh, the community trusts, and when I say the community, like, you know, if you want if you need some kind of accounting done, you go to your lawyer or your banker, or you maybe go to an accountant friend or somebody and you ask them, who do I ask? Who can do this? Right. And so there is this community that has a trust of, of, of people that get referred to do work. And 
my experience has been that experience is what gets you referred within the community, right? It's, you know, people have to have faith that you know how to handle their issues. They're not, you know, just the fact that you have the accountant label or even the CPA by your name is not enough for people to say, oh, yeah, we believe you can do it. So it's it's a very uneven distribution in that regard, in the sense that the pe- when you when you have experience and there's a community that knows you have the experience, there's plenty of work to do. Um, when you don't have the experience, it's it may be hard. It may it may be hard, and and that's a piece I don't know. I don't know right this minute. You know, the accounting cycle is often for hiring that people graduate from school in June and they're landing jobs that start in September. I don't know what that was like for those folks that just graduated in June and are now supposed would be often starting their jobs this fall. And I don't know what it's looking like for people who are doing interviews now for jobs that would start fall of 2021. That I I don't know. That That would be an interesting thing to look at as to whether that has slowed down and, and how that is for people. But yeah, it, it, it is, if you can, if you can get to that point where you've got experience and it's known that you have experience in a community, then, then, then you should be set. And I think that's probably true across a lot of professions. And I might mention, you, we've kind of danced around it, but I'd like to mention it. You know, I think le- your learning and leveling up in your career never ends. You know, like we're constantly having to, you know, CPAs are unique and the continue, well, not unique, and but they have continuing education for a reason. And I think, you know, um, I've made the folly in the past of thinking like, okay, I got my degree, I did it, let's go. You know, now I can start working and making money. The thing is, you don't stop learning and you don't stop adding new skills and, you know, more tools in your tool belt. And, and I, you know, at 40, I finally realized, you know, you have to continue to do that. And I think, you know, in doing so, even those people that, you know, like we, what you were talking about, Ty, with the, the folks that just graduated and are in that hiring cycle of graduating in June and getting a job in October, if that has fallen off, I would say to those people, you know, start, continue learning, continue to start digging into an industry that you would like to be in and learn learn those industry specific things or or learn, you know, level up your accounting knowledge to understand, you know, maybe something that you're not familiar with or a new area that you would like to learn. It will be beneficial exponentially to you to know that kind of thing and to be able to speak with somebody in that industry and you'll be ahead of the game, I think, because a lot of people do rest on the laurel of having a degree or knowing something or being at a certain level um, but learning doesn't end and you're, you're, you know, like we talked about before, the, the growth of your portfolio knowledge, for lack of a better word, doesn't end. You need to continue to add to the knowledge that you possess in certain areas. And the, the most brilliant people that I've met and the most competent accountants that I know are ones that continue to learn and continue to try new things and understand new things and refine the knowledge that they already have. Well, and just to expand on that, I mean, learning itself is a skill that you learn how to learn better. And I know that sounds a little redundant, but I mean, over time, you learn how to take in new information and process it into something you can use. And so I think if the only thing you're doing is just learning, even the skill of just learning something else that you might not use still hones your ability to take in some other new piece of information down the road on a whole unrelated topic. And so it's just a skill of being in that mindset of always trying to learn something new so all right our next article here is actually a follow-up to an article we did quite a while ago but uh i think back in like almost a year ago when we started the podcast we did a small article on les schwab a local oregon company that was for sale and in fact they found a buyer so uh the firm uh that bought them is meritage group and actually the uh Les, so Les Schwab got sold. The amount was undisclosed. We knew back at the time when we talked about this uh, article before about them being for sale, they wanted $3 billion with a B for the sale. Um, and uh, we don't know if they got that or not, but they do know that uh, it was sold. And so I thought it was a nice follow-up. I don't know that we have much to add to that, but thought we'd follow it up and Good for Les Schwab. They said that none of the none of the uh, financial or operations and management team will change. So for anybody that uses Les Schwab, it just has a different owner. Anyway, you got another one for us, Charlie? 
Yeah, no, good to hear. I've got nothing but good things to say about Les Schwab. I've used them before, and so I hope they uh, continue to be good. Uh, I got an article from NBC News called Man Illegally Sought Coronavirus Loans, which I'm going to use in, in quotes there, uh, for companies named after Game of Thrones, Justice Department says. And so there's a person named Tristan Pan, and basically what he's accused of is fraudulently seeking paycheck protection loans for companies with names like White Walker LLC and The Night Watch LLC. He did uh, $6 million in, in relief funding requested. He did 14 different applications using fake documents all the way up through false tax filings and uh, managed to secure 1.7 million in loans before being found out. And so I guess I wanted to get your guys' take on, is this the least original uh, fraud you've ever heard of? To have a guy just like turn on his TV and just like start writing down the names and then submitting his, his coronavirus loans? What do you guys think? Well, I, I will say I think lawsuits are coming just like winter. But uh, <laughs> I, I, th I think probably, uh, you know, I, I would have probably pulled from a couple of different, if, if I was in his position wanting to make fraudulent PPP loans, I might have pulled from different uh, TV shows. So it wasn't so obvious that you have White Walker LLC and, you know, West, Westero, you know, Limited or whatever he was using. Uh, so uh, I was sad to see that he didn't use uh, Cersei as one of the uh, uh, companies because if you're going to do an evil deed you might as well have the most evil character in uh, Game of Thrones on there oh. but uh, you know I don't know I mean we've been hearing a lot of, I think the point that I want to make on these whole coronavirus stimulus package PPP loan frauds is that we hear and much like we hear you know about accountants behaving badly we only hear about the bad ones we don't hear about the majority of that money going to good businesses that put it to good use to keep people employed i think is what i would say am i surprised that somebody came up with an ingenious names for their for their fake businesses that got you know def tried to defraud the government for money no whenever you have a cash grab like this or a, a essentially what is a, a free grant loans or free grant money you're, you're going to have all the fraudsters come out from underneath the rocks and try and take advantage of this um i i think it makes for an interesting story the business names he used but i i don't find it necessarily surprising anymore that this happens but i think for the public and for especially our friends in accounting, you know, the vast majority of this money went to people that needed it or used it correctly under the law. And these are the few outliers that the news gloms onto to have a story. And yeah, I mean, I think uh, one thing I'd point out is that it's possible to have legitimate businesses with Game of Thrones names on them. Uh, if you were, you know, you just had to set up a bunch of LLCs, you know, like if you were a real estate developer and you, held a bunch of real estate assets and you just needed abstract names for these LLCs. I could, I could see myself doing something like that. In fact, uh, there was one year where I named all my garden beds. So in my garden, my, the beds were all laid out and I had a lot of beds. And so all the garden beds were named after locations in Game of Thrones. And I even went to the trouble to try to make them relatively geographically uh, correct relative to each other. So, you know, the nor the, Winterfell was in the north versus King's Landing, which was down farther in the south, and so on. So, so I've 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 uh, I've crossed this road myself, this path myself before, and uh, I don't do that anymore because uh, nobody else around me seems to know Game of Thrones references as well uh, here at here at the house. So, I, I thought King's Landing was going to be your parking spot, but you know. Oh, there we go. I, I should have done that. I want to know how many PPP loans your your flower beds were able to get. <laughs> figure out. Those, All right. are, those are very expensive tomatoes, I will tell you for sure. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> the the beneficial bugs were your employees that yeah. you need to pay. Yes. Uh, there's something I could benefit for some depreciation on. <laughs> All right. Last article for today. <clears throat> this one I thought was kind of interesting. We did a story or we've mentioned in the past on this podcast about the uh, infamous or famous story about a guy who outsourced his job to uh, uh, basically a gig worker, uh, uh, kind of uh, outsourced his own job in coding to somebody in China and what spent his days going through Facebook and playing video games and essentially clocking in and clocking out and getting his 
his deliverables or his coding from uh, the guy he hired in China to do it at a much less rate. This one is actually uh, from, and this has been all over the place, but the article that I pulled was from the New York Post. And the headline is MTA workers, which is the transportation authority. Uh, MTA workers had hidden man cave below Grand Central tracks. And so what this was, was these MTA uh, tradesmen uh, had like an abandoned, not an abandoned, but an unused like uh, uh, room that was below the tracks and they turned it into a man cave essentially. And they had like a futon couch and a TV and a microwave and a pull-up bar where they could work out streaming devices that were connected to their phones and had their names on it. And uh, lo and behold, they got caught. And so uh, I'd kind of like to get your guys' take on this. I thought it was really kind of admirable to be honest with you. Uh, but um, I will read you a quote from the uh, railroad president, Cindy, and she called the man cave outrageously inappropriate and not consistent with Metro North values. So I thought I, these guys were really ingenious. They had plywood stuff that would cover the TV and everything. So if you went in there and looked at it, it looked like, you know, an abandoned storeroom or something like that with these wood boxes everywhere. And when they would come in, they would take the wood boxes off, fire up the streaming TV and uh, watch Twitch, watch people play games on Twitch. So I thought it was a pretty interesting story that kind of crossed, crossed the line probably of what you should be doing during your break uh, at uh, your Metro job. But I'd kind of like to get your guys' take on it. I mean, I guess it's interesting that, like, when did having a break room become such a terrible offense? Like, the, the what these guys did was did some pull-ups, watched some Twitch, and, like, if their jobs were set up in such a way that they were being, you know, tracked meaningfully or whatever, then we would assume they're getting everything they need to get done before going into the break room. So, I guess I don't view it as such a big travesty that these guys are doing some pull-ups down there. I think that sounds like probably better use for that room than anybody else is going to do with it. So yeah, I think it's fine. Yeah. I didn't, uh, I didn't quite get it either. I think there was a line in there about them commandeering a prime piece of Manhattan real estate. So I'm like, so what is the issue here that, that they're using square footage inappropriately or that they're, that they're hanging out, on work while getting paid. I, I wasn't sure what, what was the, what was the exact inappropriateness of this. Uh, yeah. And I think Charlie framed it nicely. I mean, you know, why, why is it wrong to have a break room? You know, if, if they're as long, as long as they're getting their work done and uh, nobody's uh, they're not being uh, taxpayers, public's not paying for their time to just hang out and not work. That would, that would be an issue, but that'd be an issue anywhere, whether it was in the man cave or somewhere else in a coffee shop or something, right? Um, and then, you know, secondarily to that, then is it really an issue because this is a prime piece of real estate that they're uh, using underneath underneath the Grand Central? St I mean, I just imagining kind of where this thing is. It's a, you know, a dungeon underneath the Grand Central Station that they're calling a prime piece of real estate because of its proximity to uh, to central new york i guess yeah I'll, I'll leave it on this the streamer tifu that was what that they were watching on the thing called them effing legends and i think that that's exactly how i feel about them they're effing legends exactly. and i might mention their carpentry skills are not bad the the plywood that they had to cover the uh essentials in there was quite quite well made so kudos to those guys shout out to, to the mta workers that did it from from us for whatever that means you know right <laughs> They got away with it for a long time. So yeah, must have they got they got them. approval of the none of our businesses pod uh, crew. <laughs> I'm sure their union rep doesn't like us for it, but oh well, you know. <laughs> All right, from none of our businesses podcast. Thanks for watching and listening. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, listen again, put us on your Spotify playlist, and uh, we'll see you here next week with more news from an accounting accountant's perspective. Have a good weekend. See you, Thanks.